I hope this class is, uh, is being beneficial uh, for us. We have spent some weeks uh, trying to look at just some biblical explanations as to what causes some folks to fall away. I, I, you know, there, there's, there's nothing more painful, nothing more painful uh, in the Lord's church than to see members of that church, to see our family members, uh, to see, see uh, folks that we know and love to, uh, to walk away from the Lord. Uh, there's, there's just nothing more painful than that. Um, you know, the, 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 the subject of withdrawal of fellowship is not, is not really a part of this particular series that we're going through, but boy, that, that is a topic that is completely misunderstood uh, by so many people and, and misused, mischaracterized by people. Uh, the, the whole purpose of withdrawal of fellowship is it is an act of love. Uh, towards those individuals to try to get them to come back. And the very idea that some people have expressed that it's just kicking people out of the church, uh, if it, it is a painful thing to go through because of the love that we have for people's souls. So I, I, hope, I hope this study is, is beneficial for us from a variety of reasons, helping us to understand what causes people to fall away. And obviously we can't exhaust that list but in these classes that we started last week and as we'll go through this week and the next couple weeks, just looking at what are some things that we can do to help them to come back. And again, we can't exhaust that, uh, that either. Um, and uh, as we go through these various classes, what we're doing is we're getting into a Bible text and we're just letting the Bible text give us some things that we could do. We, we could spend time tonight, there's... Uh, 75 people in here probably, we could spend time tonight and say, okay, what do you think are some things we could do? And we could come up with 150 different ideas from us. But what we're trying to do is just get into biblical text and say, here's what the Bible says are some things that we could do to help some individuals to come home. Um, and, and hopefully those are helpful for you. So hopefully they're practical. Hopefully maybe it just it gives you some idea. Oh, that's an idea. Maybe I could go and do this. Uh, but the whole purpose of this is to help us to truly recognize that our responsibility as Christians is not only to seek and to save the lost souls who have never obeyed the gospel, but is also to seek and to save those lost souls who once obeyed the gospel but wandered away from it. Uh, and so our eyes have constantly got to be open uh, to those souls who are around us. So as, as we get into this discussion tonight, I, at the very heart of folks falling away, at least at the heart of a lot of people becoming unfaithful. Think about this sentence that I'm saying. At the very heart of a lot of people becoming unfaithful is the heart. Why do people leave the Lord? Why do they walk away? Can we come up with an answer that does not say it has something to do with their heart? has something to do with where they are in their devotion to the Lord. That they once, their heart was at one time in one place, but something happened over time that caused their heart to stray away from where it was before. I want you to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2 tonight. And uh, when you go over to Revelation chapter 2, I know hopefully your wheels start turning. Uh, and you think, okay, what's in Revelation chapter 2? You go to Revelation chapter 2, and chapter 3, and what do you read about in these two chapters? Okay, you read in Revelation 2 and 3, you read uh, Jesus' letters to the seven churches of Asia, or his letters to the seven churches of Asia. Uh, and uh, in each of these letters, there's a lot of commonalities. Uh, there are some commendations, there are some condemnations, and there are some encouragements uh, in each of these letters. Um, when you get to the, and, and we, we don't have time to even rehearse each of these letters or even give an overview of them, uh, but when you get to the first letter, who is the first in Revelation chapter 2? Who is this first letter written to? Church in Ephesus. Have you ever read anything else in the New Testament about the church at Ephesus, or is this the only place you read about them? You read about them anywhere else? You read about them where? In the book that's called Ephesians. Who was that letter written to? The church at Ephesus. And so there's a letter written to the church at Ephesus called Ephesians. Another letter 
Who wrote this letter in Revelation chapter 2? John did. What color are the letters in your Bible in Revelation chapter 2? Red. So whose letter is this? Jesus' letter written by whose hand? John. When you read the book of Ephesians, who wrote that letter? Paul. What color are those letters in the Bible? <laughs> Blind Jackie. So the, Paul wrote that letter to the church at Ephesus. Those letters are black. But where did he get those words? Can we say Jesus? So John wrote these words from Jesus, and they're in red. Paul wrote those letters from Jesus, and they're in black. What's the difference between the black letters and the red letters in your Bible? Are they all from Jesus? Can we say that? I believe there's a verse in the Bible that says all... Do you have that verse in your Bible? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So does that include the red letters and the black letters? I believe that includes all of the letters, right? So it includes the Ephesian letter, and that and Ephesian letter includes this letter. All right, that's too much time on that. So we get to Revelation chapter 2, written to the church at Ephesus. We've got a letter to the church at Ephesus. We've got Paul in Acts chapter 19 stopping in the city of Ephesus and baptizing 12 men there. And we know in this third missionary journey that he spends three years in the city of Ephesus, longer than he spent in any other city. Uh, on any of his missionary journeys. He spends three years in the city of Ephesus. When he is on his way at the end of that third missionary journey, when he's on his way to Jerusalem, where he's going to be arrested and bound and spend the rest of his life as a prisoner, he stops in Miletus in Acts chapter 20, and he calls for a group of elders to come and meet him. Where are those elders from? Ephesus. We've got a lot in the Bible. Uh, we've got a lot in the New Testament about Ephesus. What is... The, church, the letter to the church at Ephesus, what were, in, in just these seven letters, there are seven verses, I mean, in these seven verses, what were they known for? What summarized this, if you could just give me a one or two words, three or four words, what had they done? What was wrong? They had left their first love. I don't, do you have chapter headings? Do you have paragraph headings? In your Bible, some of you do, some of you don't. Uh, do you have anything above chapter 2 and verse 1 in your Bible? You got anything in there? Say it again. The loveless church. Were they the loveless church? Look in chapter 2 and verse 4, where Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. The New King James says that you have left your first love. Okay. What does that mean? They were not as, in, as enthusiastic uh, as they once were. What did you say in the back? They walked away. They walked away. What, 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 is, what, is, what is some, this, this is, uh, it's, it's going to sound like a trick question. I don't mean it is. What is somebody's first love? It depends on how you define first, doesn't it? Now, for the men in here, can you remember the name of your first love? Some of you say, yeah, she's sitting next to me. I've been married. Yeah, 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 right. Any of you have a girlfriend before your wife? Do you remember her name? Do you know I don't remember anybody else's name in the second grade except for my little girlfriend in the second grade. I remember her name. I, don't, I assume there were other kids in the second grade. Don't have a clue what they well, except for Billy. But I don't have a clue the rest of their names. But I remember her name. Sixth grade. Guess what? I don't remember anybody I went to sixth grade with except for her name. What is it about somebody's first love? As if second grade could be your first love. It's special. There's something tied there. Now, is that what is, is that chronological? Love. That's using first in a chronological sense. Is that the way that it's being used here? Was Jesus their first love chronologically? No, probably not. Had they been, so, so what is the word, do you, does your translation say something different than left your first love? Anybody got anything different? 
What did you say, Nicole? The love, the love you, that, it, it, that's it. The love you had at the first. What does that mean? Again, that could be, appear to be chronological, but not necessarily going back chronological to the beginning of your life but chronological back to the beginning of your relationship with Jesus. What had they done? They had walked away from the love that they had at the first for Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't like this terminology because I think it cheapens, but I'm going to go ahead and use it, and because I think it cheapens the relationship to use this terminology. But when somebody first becomes a Christian, do they first, when they, do they become a Christian because they have fallen in love with Jesus? That's terminology I don't like because of the way we use it today, and I think it's cheap. But did they become a Christian because they fell in love with Jesus? Is that why you become a Christian? I want, I, I want, you, to, I want, I want you to think about that for a minute. When you become a Christian, how much do you love Jesus? How much have you been overwhelmed with love for Jesus? Here's, here's, here's where I think we are sometimes. When, we, when we're teaching somebody to become a Christian or when individuals are thinking about becoming a Christian, sometimes people become a Christian because they're scared of hell. And so they become a Christian. Is that a good reason to become a Christian? Anybody want to go to hell? I mean, I, I mean I, okay, I, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to become a Christian. But if that's the depth of why you become a Christian, if that's the first, if that's the premier reason you become a Christian, where are you going to be for the rest of your Christian life? You're going to be living a Christian life as a scaredy cat. I'm scared of God, I'm scared of hell, I'm scared of messing up. Is that the way to live a Christian life, is to be scared all the time? Is that what Jesus wants? I mean, I've seen some parents who raise their kids to be scared of them all of the time, but is that what God wants? Sometimes people read the Bible and they think, oh, well, God wants us to be scared of him. They, we, he, they, he wants us to be scared. We're, he's going to zap us. Is that, what God, is, that, is that really what God wants? Diane? Okay. He wants you to put him first in your life, and so there is a... The, the, the idea of having, having this first love concept is that there is, it's not just that's how I was at the start of my relationship with him, but in this relationship with him, he takes that place of preeminence, Colossians 1 verse 18. He takes first place in my life. You know, for, for a husband and a wife, and, and, and the, answer, the, the answer to this is Jesus, so I already get, I'll give you that answer. Now, that answer is not on the table anymore. For a husband and a wife, who's got to be first in their life? I already took the first answer away from you, so you can't use it. For a husband and a wife, who's got to be first? I already took that answer away from you, John. You can't use that answer. For a husband and a wife, who's got to be first? Each other. Sorry, John, I, I stole your answer. That answer's right, but you take that one away. What's, who's got to be first? The other one's got to be first. And when somebody else starts to creep into your life and they become first, what happens? Oh, you've lost your first love. They're no longer, they no longer have that preeminence. They no longer have, you no longer have that commitment and that dedication to them. And so when it talks about them leaving their first love, the idea here is that their love has cooled off. It's no longer hot. Now, this is the first letter. When you fast forward to the end of chapter 3 and you get to the last letter of the church of Laodicea, what are they known for? What were they? They were neither hot nor cold, but they were lukewarm. How does, was Jesus okay with that? Not. Okay, so... If Jesus doesn't want us to be lukewarm in our love for him, and he doesn't want us to be cold in our love for him, well, what does that leave? So what, what causes, when it says that these individuals had left their first love, it's not, you know, we, and again, this is, this is cheap terminology, and, I, and I'm not using it in this case, I'm using it in the way we use it today. We talk about people today falling out of love. 
You heard that, right? You've used that. They fell out of love with each other. What does that mean? They fell out of love. Did it hurt? Did they hit their knee on the way down? What does it mean? Say it again. Fell out of love. You stopped holding them in the same mindset that you once had them in. Say it again. Okay. Stop feeding. Did you say feeding? So, okay, yes. So you've stopped feeding that relationship. Do, do relationships, this is not a hard question, don't overthink it. Do relationships take work? Oh, okay. Have you been married before? Does that take work? Or does it just come naturally? I mean, for some people, it just comes naturally, right? Your husband is just a natural husband. He just slid right into it once you trained him. He was perfect after that. Do relationships take work? Yeah. Do relation, does our relationship with God take work? Does it take effort or does it just, you know, it just, I, I, it, it's easy. I just, it, it just comes, it, it just comes naturally and, you know, I do what I want to do and whenever I want to do it, however I want to do it, whenever it's good for me. Is that how it works? They had left their first love. Why? They were not where they once were in their service to the Lord. Our relationship with the Lord takes effort. Are we willing to put that in? So that's what we're looking. This is the context of what we're looking at tonight. This context of them leaving their first love. So, how can that happen? How can it happen that somebody leaves their first love? Back up into the. Let's go back up to the beginning of the chapter. The angel of the church at Ephesus write. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lamp stands. That's Jesus. Jesus says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear with those who are evil. He's commending them and what they are doing. But these were individuals who were still hanging on and we're still bearing against those and staying strong against evil. But does, does evil have a way of wearing us down? I mean, we live in an evil world. Does it have a way, uh, does the constant struggle that we have against the world, does it have a way of wearing us down? Does evil have a way of, after a while, starting to look like it's right? Can wrong start to look right? How can wrong start to look right? How can down start to look up? How does that happen? Say again. Okay. When, when you do wrong often enough, it starts to look right. How, how, does some, how does evil begin to look perfect and wonderful? Acceptance and callousness. Who's at work when this is happening? Who can make... Who, who can make a, a putrid, ugly, rotten apple look like something you want to bite into? Oh, so Jackie says, the devil made me do it. it the devil is at work. And here, here is Jesus commending these who have remained steadfast to say, you have been sticking true to where you need to be, but evil, does evil have a way of making God's people feel like they're missing out? No, you don't get to do all this stuff we get to do. We get to do this and that. Oh, you're a Christian. You're not, you're not able to do this. What does that do to somebody? What does that do to a child of God, perhaps, after a while? Yeah. That temptation, when it's laid out there in front of them, often enough, they just start a little experiment. Just try a little bit of it. Just try a little bit of it. Well, once you get a taste for sin... Once you get a taste for the sin that appeals to you, when you read James chapter 1 and it talks about the temptations that entice us, the things that we enjoy, when you get a little taste of that, do you like it? What, what does it say about Moses in, in Hebrews chapter 11? He made the choice, but, but he made the choice not to enjoy the passing what of sin? Passing pleasure of sin. What does that indicate? 
Sin is pleasurable. Sin, if you get a taste of it, you like it. And so if you get a little nibble of it, well, what do you want? Hmm, I might want some more of that. And so Jesus is commending them on this occasion because they're standing strong, but a constant struggle against evil, that is something that can cause somebody to leave their first love. Look at the rest of verse 2. He says, You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Can you imagine somebody coming along and saying, I'm one of the apostles. How would you know? Can I see your ID? Um, you, you don't look like one of the apostles. Well, I'm older now. I'm, I, I, I look different than I, than I used to on my, on my driver's license. I just haven't had my photo updated recently. Somebody comes along and says, I'm one of the apostles. I have been sent by the apostles. How do you know? You just take them for their word? Would it be easy to just say, wow, they, he sort of sounds like John. He's sort of saying the same things I heard John say. Eh, yeah, he's from John. We'll just listen to whatever he's got to say. Uh, can that lead you away in a hurry? What, what did Paul tell the, these, these Ephesians? What did Paul tell the Ephesian elders was going to happen after he left Acts chapter 20? That there were going to be savage somethings wolves that would come in among the flock and he said they would not spare the flock these false teachers were going to come in he warned them about it and so here were some false teachers that they were dealing with and causing some confusion perhaps among them trying to figure out are they really telling the truth or not telling the truth in fact down in verse 6 he says uh, this you uh, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. Well, that's a good thing. Uh, there, there's some question about who the Nicolaitans were and exactly what they were teaching. This comes up again, by the way, when you get down in the letter to the church at Pergamos. Uh, when you get down into the letter uh, to them, it's going to come up again. The Nicolaitans, where is that? Verse 15, uh, he, re he talks about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans when he gets down there. So they've got some kind of doctrine. They've got some kind of deeds. Some people believe that they were going around teaching um, that, that it was okay to compromise with, with the ways of the world, that it was okay to kind of go along uh, with, uh, with what the world was having to offer. There, there was a doctrine that was coming about around this time that was teaching the difference between somebody's flesh and somebody's spirit. Uh, and so they were teaching things like your, your flesh can do whatever it wants because it has no impact on your spirit at all. That sounds good, right? I can, I can engage in whatever sins I want, and it doesn't have any impact on my soul. That's kind of an appealing doctrine, isn't it? Do what you want, you can still go to heaven. Does that fit what the Bible says? Hmm, no, not anywhere close. But whatever this doctrine is, whatever the deeds that they were doing were, were things that had been made up by man, but they were staying strong against them. But look in verse 3. Verse 3 says, And you have persevered, and have patience. I want you to compare the beginning of verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3. Beginning of verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience. Beginning of verse 3, and you have persevered and have patience. What's going on? You have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. There were some struggles that these Christians were dealing with. Uh, the, I, the word persevere here in verse 3. Um, Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. You know what that verse says? If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, but take up his cross daily. Take up your cross. Similar terminology to what's being used right here in, in perseverance. That these trials, these troubles, these struggles that, uh, that you have in life, they come in and what were they were bearing up under them. But is it possible that whatever cross a Christian has to bear might just end up being too much? And, some, and a Christian says, you know what? It's not worth it i'm tired of putting up with this i'm done and so that's why god urges his people whatever pains and struggles they're going through whatever disappointments they're having in life that's why god urges his people to use those opportunities to become stronger and to develop a stronger character and so th these are just in this context and and we've spent time in other contexts in other passages looking at uh, how people can fall away. But just in this context, those are some ways 
that people can leave their first love. But I, I want to ask you this. I want to go back to how we started this. At the heart of probably most people falling away is their heart. If somebody does not truly love the Lord, what's going to happen when persecution comes? If somebody does not truly love the Lord, what's going to happen when just difficult days come? What's going to happen if you don't really love the Lord? What's going to happen when temptations come and then more temptations come and then more temptations come? You don't really love the Lord. What's going to happen when somebody mistreats you, when somebody in the church mistreats you? If you don't really love the Lord, it's going to be easy to fall away. So here's, and I've done a lot of thinking, at least I've tried to do a lot of thinking about this as I've been thinking about this lesson, and I wonder for us, why do you come to church Sundays and Wednesdays? Why are you involved in the activities of the church? Is it, because, is it because I don't want to go to hell? You know, if I'm involved here, then I've got a better chance of not going to hell. Is it because I, I've just set that as a priority in my life, and it's a priority in my life, and I'm not going to miss church, and I'm going to study my Bible, and I'm going to do all of these things I'm supposed to do, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, minimizing that at all. Why do you do what you do as a Christian? Do you love Jesus? Not, not, not do you believe in him. Not are you convinced he's the son of God. He absolutely died for me. I know he did it. That's up here. And it's got to be more than just, intell- the Christian life has got to be more than just intellectual. It's got to be, don't, don't misunderstand. It's got to be intellectual. You have to, you have to investigate the evidence you have to investigate it for yourself and to weigh the evidence and say, yes, that is absolutely true and that knowledge brings faith and I believe Jesus is the Son of God. But do you love Him? Do you love Him? In marriage, do difficult days ever come in a marriage? I thought about Novella, I thought about asking you that question, but I'm not going to ask you that question. Do difficult days come in marriage? Yes. Okay? The day after you say, I do, difficult, and maybe even the day you say, I do, difficult days start coming. What keeps you together? If it's simply, well, I said I do, so I'm just going to stick it out. Or do you fall in love with that person? And does your love bind you so close to them that no matter what you do, I'm going to stay with you? How does the Bible use the word love? Not just a mushy feeling, not just a mushy greeting card. Oh, I, I adore you so much. What is, how does the Bible define love? Bears all things, believes all things. Say it again. It's everlasting. It's what? Unconditional. It's unselfish. Do we have that for our spouse? Do we have that for Jesus? Is my love for Jesus unconditional? Sometimes people's love for Jesus is conditional. Well, where's Jesus been? Oh, this has been happening to me. Where's he been? What? I don't know if I, I'm not sure I can stick this out with him anymore if he's not going to be there for me. What's that? Making conditions, our conditions. What's he done for me lately? Selfishness. None of that comes into play if, if I've got a true love for the Lord. And, and I'm spending more time here, but we put a lot of emphasis, and rightly so, on keeping the commandments of God. Can we go to heaven if we do not keep his commandments? No. You read, uh, what is it, Revelation 22, verses somewhere around verses 14 or 15 in the New King James and King James. It says, 
outside are those who didn't keep his commandments. you got to keep his commandments to go to heaven. But what did Jesus say leads somebody to keep his commandments? If you love me, keep my commandments. What causes some people to stop wanting to keep his commandments has to do with the fact that they've lost their love for him. They've lost the fact that he's no longer their first love. Uh, and without that kind of love for Christ in our lives, then the Christian life can very easily become a burden. Oh, I got to go to church. Oh, I, I, I got to do that. Oh, the elders asked me to do that. Really, I got to do that? If the Christian life is a burden of, of stuff I've got to do, maybe I need to back up and say, how much do I love the Lord? Because if I simply look at it as just some kind of a grudging uh, thing that I have to do, and I am reluctantly just going to go along with it, then do I really have a love for the Lord? Why do people fall away? This may be a reason for it. Uh, and so that's why it's so important, and I don't have time to, to go through all of this because I want to get to the next point. Um, but that's why it's so important for us as we begin to think about what causes people to fall away, how can we get them to come back, is in my mind to focus on helping them to love Jesus again. That The chapter that uh, Diane quoted, you know, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The love chapter, you get down to the end of the chapter and it says, now abides faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is the greatest one. The greatest one is love. The beginning of the chapter says, you, if, I, if I could do all sorts of great things, but I don't have love, it doesn't profit me a single thing. And so I, I could be on the outside a great Christian doing a lot of things to impress other people, but if I don't have a true love for the Lord, what does it profit me? It doesn't profit me anything in the short run or in the long run. So, here's the question. We've got seven minutes here. When we talk about leaving our first love, how can we get folks to come back? Look in verse, look in verse 5. Revelation 2 and verse 5, Jesus mentions three things to this church. As he talks to them about the great things they're doing in verses 2 and 3, as he tells them in verse 4 what he has against you. Can you imagine Jesus saying, I have this against you? Would that take your breath away? Oh, what? You have this again? You have left your first love. Do you think they had to, you think they had to look up in, in the dictionary what that meant to leave your first love? Or did that cut them to the heart? Oh, we know what that means. Jesus is no longer first and foremost in our lives. And so he tells them in verse 5, number 1, you need to remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Where had they fallen from? What does that mean? Remember from where you have fallen. Well, where had they fallen from? Say again. Okay. They had been doing everything from the heart. Uh, somebody else said something. Was that you, John, or somebody else? They had departed from the faith. Okay, they had departed from the faith. Remember from where you have fallen. Remember how much you loved Jesus. If, if we are, we, we, we talked about this concept of remember last week. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting to me. Hebrews chapter 10, where we were last week, when God is appealing to Christians to come back to him and not fall away, what did he tell them in verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 10? Remember. <laughs> and now here in Revelation chapter 2, when Jesus is appealing to people who are falling away from him to come back to him, what does he say? Remember. That's, there's something powerful about recalling things in our mind. Can we help somebody by just saying to them, do you remember how much you used to love Jesus? Do you remember how much you used to love God? Why did you love him so much? Did you not love him because he first loved you? 
Maybe we can say to somebody, do you remember, go back in your heart, do you remember how much Jesus first loved you? That's, that's, what, that's what sprung that, that, that love in your heart was the learning of the love that He had for you. And love breeds love into your heart. Remember the joy and the peace that you had when you became a Christian. We sing a song sometimes. We only sing the, I think the only thing we know of this song is the chorus because we sing it sometimes when somebody's baptized and sometimes when they come up, or at least the old days. It's probably been a dozen years since I remember singing this song when somebody's baptized. Anyway, somebody's baptized, we'd sing, Happy Day, that fixed my choice. But what's, what's that chorus about? It's kind of a sad song if you read the beginning of verses. But anyway, chorus is about, this is a happy day when I'm baptized and Jesus washes my sins away. Can we help somebody to remember the joy and the peace that they had with that? Remember the relationship that they had with Jesus and what they were intending to do with that relationship. To remember the purpose that they had. To remember the determination and the zeal that they once... Why, why were you a Christian? Why did you serve the Lord for a while? Because of the hope that I had of going to heaven. Do you remember that? And again, all of this is built on that concept of the strength of memories. And we may come back and build on this some more in some future lessons. But when Jesus says here, remember, um, when Simba ran away, you remember when, you know Simba? When Simba ran away, and his father Mufasa, who was dead, so it was the spirit of Mufasa who appeared to Simba to get him to come to himself and to remember and go back to the Pride Land or whatever it was called and to take care of his family. What did Mufasa say to Simba? Re oh, you remember what he said. Remember who you are. If, if Mufasa understood the significance of remembering, maybe we can help. So what, what had Simba done? He had run away. Boy, that's way off track, isn't it? But Mufasa got that from Jesus. Sorry, Jesus said it first. Jesus said, remember who you are. You are my son. He didn't say you're the one true king, but he said, remember who you are. Second thing, sorry, that was off track. Second thing in verse 5, remember, and then you need to repent. This is the hard part. Remembering is just bringing those thoughts back into somebody's heart again, not just their mind, but back into somebody's heart. But repenting is the hard part. Repenting is being affected by what we just remembered. I had those memories of what it used to be like. That needs to affect me. Those memories need to create godly sorrow within me. Godly sorrow that I'm not there anymore. I turn my back on the Lord. And, and what, the way I'm living, the Lord doesn't deserve this. I need to go back. And, and I think too often we have allowed indifference in our hearts to just camp out. And we need to help people to get rid of the indifference that's in their heart and, and to recognize that they've got to be affected by godly sorrow. They need to remember what the Lord has done for them again to a group of Christians who were all about themselves and were turning uh, in, inward instead of turning upward. In, Ro in, Romans, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul says, Do you not know that the goodness of the Lord produces repentance, leads to repentance? If somebody has fallen away, ask them, Has there been any time in your life when the Lord's been good to you? What did you do to deserve that goodness? Has God continued to be good to you? Has God continued to be patient with you, even in what you are doing? Should that not cause you to repent? And then to recognize that there is great cost in refusing to repent. That's the next verse in Romans chapter 2. You get down into verse 5, and it says, Those who refuse to repent will suffer the wrath of God. And that's not something we want to talk to somebody about who has fallen away, but perhaps that's the thought we need to plant in their minds is about the long-term consequences. And because of time, we've got to rush into this. Third thing that Jesus mentions in verse 5. Remember, number two, repent. And number five is repeat. Go back and do the first works. Isn't that interesting? 
They had fallen from their, they had left their first love, and he tells them you need to go back and to repeat the first works. If you and your spouse are struggling in your marriage, if you have, as people say today, you've fallen out of love, what can help you to fall back in love with each other? Go back and do what you did when you were dating each other. Go back and do the first things that you did to make him fall in love with you, to make her fall in love with you. Go back and do the first things that generated that love, and it will perhaps spark that love back in your marriage again. If that's true about an earthly relationship, what about a heavenly relationship? What if we encourage somebody to go back and do those things that they once did at the beginning and to nurture and to feed, to use the word that uh, Willie used a little bit ago, to feed that in their lives. There's a lot here in Revelation chapter 2 and, and, and in all of this, but perhaps there's something in what we've talked about tonight that we can use to help some individuals to think about where they are and to think about coming back home. Thank you all very much for your good attention tonight.